Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another message from Fountain Springs Church. My name is Kevin, and I'm on staff at FSC. I'm glad you're joining not just me, but our in-person and online locations worshiping God together. Today, we are going to hear last week's message from one of our pastors. And spoiler alert, it's been shortened a bit to be broadcasted here on your screen. If you want to listen to the whole message, go to our website at messages.fs.church to listen to it all. Again, we are glad you're joining us. We have a tendency to say, I want to be close to God. And then you might even remember some moments where you're like, I felt really close to God. But then you got away from him. You're like, wonder what happened. Did God get busy and go do something different? Does he not like me? And oftentimes we find it that it's we. We have drifted from him. So the series has been simple. How do you and I keep from drifting? How do we drop an anchor? And there's multiple anchor options. I'm going to teach you our final one. There's a bunch of them, but our final one I'm going to teach you. But I want to show you my agenda uh, right off the bat, actually. I, listen, I should probably not do this, but uh, I'm going to teach some history. Don't, for those of you who, like, that's when you got up and, and left class because, you don't know, no, I, the, the history will be, I think, meaningful and helpful. But I think one of the good parts of history lessons are it should bring you to a decision moment where you think up here, all right, here's what I've decided that I believe and I'm going to do with that, that then leads you to an action. So the makeup of this sermon is this, history, decision, action. You clear? So we're going to start with some history. So let me take you in to the history books. This is an exodus. So this is God giving description, details to say, I want you to build uh, the tabernacle. I want, you to, I want you to put this thing together, but I've got specific instructions. And here's the instructions, or at least part of them. For the inside of the tabernacle, uh, make a special curtain of finely woven linen. Decorate it with blue, purple, and scarlet thread and with skillfully embroidered cherubim. Hang this curtain on gold hooks attached to four posts of acacia wood. Overlay the posts with gold. You're like, I mean, this is detailed, right? This, these are what they have to do, and they better do it right. Overlay the posts with gold and set them in four silver bases. Hang the inner curtains from clasps and put the Ark of the Covenant, that's important, Ark of the Covenant, in the room behind it. This curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. Now, oftentimes, uh, I would be in class and the teacher would say stuff. And I'd be like, <laughs> I have no idea what you just said. I don't know. I, just, I, I, I was thinking about outside for a second. So, so let, me, let me show you pictures. Eh? Let me show you some pictures of what that just detailed. Now, for those of you who are like literal thinkers, no. These are not photos taken in the moment. Uh, <clears throat> where'd he get those? Uh, so this is what's described, a little bit of what's described of what I just shared with you. Uh, it was describing this veil, this curtain. What you're going to notice is there's stuff on this side, and we'll do a series later on that describes all this. And then on the other side is the forbidden place. You couldn't go there. That was off limits. In fact, only one person, one time a year, could cross through here, known as the high priest. If you want to know how big of a deal it was, you couldn't cross through there breaking any of God's rules. So you wanted to make sure that one, as you and I would say, or that he was living right, <laughs> that he was doing all the things that God wanted him to do. Because if you crossed that border into what was perceived as the presence of God and you did not do it the way God told you to do it, you died right like that. Uh, this picture here gives you a little bit uh, this takes you to the temple, not the tabernacle, and shows you a little bit of the scale of what's going on. Now, again, yes, we're in history class, and, but, but you got to see, you got to see, because this is visual, you got to see that, that there was an era that if you wanted to go into the presence of God, the answer was no. Just flat out no. The high priest could once a year. But if you wanted to be like, you know what, I just want to have a super spiritual moment, a very intimate moment with God. I'm just going to go on the other side of the curtain because it's really no big deal. It's just a curtain. No. God actually created a defining border between him and others. 
If you want to know why, because you're like, that doesn't sound like the God I like. Well, okay, uh, Isaiah 59 gives us a little, uh, it's your sins that have cut you off from God. If you're a Christian, or if you're even seeking your understanding, going, wait a minute, I'm not perfect, and I recognize that. I've got sin in my life. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. You've got to wrestle with that. That seems intense and <clears throat> unfriendly. <laughs> that God would say, you sinned and you're cut off. End of sentence. But many of you know the rest of the story. Right? You know that it didn't stay that way. So let me take you into the New Testament, into the life of Jesus, to actually the end of the life of Jesus. And Jesus is on the cross. Matthew 27 then Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. At that moment, at that moment, the curtain that you now know about, the curtain, at that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two. And note what the author makes sure that you and I get, a detail, that it was torn from top to bottom, top to bottom. <clears throat> I know you have ladders in your garage. They didn't have that. So from top to bottom, because a skeptic might say, well, to get this story, they would have gone in and torn it. And where would you have to tear it from? From bottom to top. That's the only way you could do it because you couldn't get all the way up there. And note the author makes sure that you understand exactly what happened. It was torn from top to bottom. Try, and, and, and for those of you even, you're like, well, well, that's what Christians say. No, this is actually documented outside of Christian literature that this moment happened, the moment that Jesus dies, that curtain in the temple torn top to bottom. Now, some of us are like, neat, right? You're like, what's the big deal? Well, there is a big deal. I can show you where you can begin to discover what big deal this is. You got to go to Hebrews. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place that I described to you, that used to be blocked off by a curtain. Now you're seeing Christians operate going, no, we got confidence to go to God. Like, we're not, we don't feel bad about it. Like, we get to go be with, this is awesome. We have confidence to enter the most holy place by how the blood of Jesus, he died. So you know that moment. Hmm. By a new and living way opened for us through the curtain. That is his body. To give you, like, let me just tell you my point. 1 John 1, 9. But if we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just. Just meaning he didn't just say, well, you sin, but so does everybody else. It's no big deal. No justice in. He knows what good justice is. Just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, whatever you did that you've told someone or that you haven't, no matter how good of a Christian you are or aren't, Jesus died for your sins to cover your sins, to take care of your sin debt so that when you think about eternity, that you don't have to think about, well, how have I opened up the door for everybody? Have I been nice? What about that one time that I lost my temper? And yet you and I don't have to think that way, that we don't have to be good enough and have enough good works. Jesus took care of your sins and my sins and said, here's what I want you to do. Trust me for that. That's stinking good news because just your own pastor who sometimes, I know, loses his temper. When I'm reminded of the grace that I have, that does something to me. But you know my problem, and it might be yours too. I forget. We all battle with what I call spiritual amnesia. I just told you that Jesus loves you. He died for you. You're like, yes. And maybe for some of us, as soon as an hour from now, when we're in a moment that's not our best moment, it's just not up here anymore. And I think you and I have to I should process this. Paul David Tripp speaks about this forgetting stuff and not, we've lost our wonder. Like, We've lost something about our thinking about God and how amazing he is. And in so doing, have shrunk 
our souls to the size of momentary earthbound hopes and dreams. <clears throat> if you don't know what this means, in our culture nowadays, we've lost how incredible God is and are now dwelling on how cool a championship might be. And we think that's the coolest thing, that's the most amazing thing. No, I mean, it's neat. But it's momentary. <clears throat> you know something about a championship? Next year, someone's likely going to win it. Okay, I'm soapboxing here. Because we have, we get disappointed. I wonder if that's where some of us are right now. Mad and envious too quickly. So what do we do? It's the anchor that I would call rituals. Now, rituals, when I say the word rituals, <clears throat> this preacher's kid's like, oh, man, church, religion, I don't want anything to do with it. Let me give you a definition of rituals, and you'll begin to see how it plays out in your actual life. Rituals help us express our deepest thoughts about what is important. Rituals. You might have places that you go, but even more than just traditions, like inside of those traditions, many of us have what you would call ritual, where you'd be like, no, we do it this way. You learn about these when you get married. Because you're like, you do that, that way. You celebrate Thanksgiving that way? That's weird, right? Or, or Christmas, or you, you've got them, birthdays, anniversaries. You and I, we celebrate these things, but inside of just the tradition of it, we're doing something. First Chronicles. Let me show you this. Uh, remember the wonders he has performed. <clears throat> Do an inventory right now. How good are you at remembering the wonders he has performed? Just begin to think that way. Remember the wonders he has performed. Remember his miracles. Remember the rulings he has given. Notice what God is trying to direct you and I to. Remembering. Do you know why? because he doesn't want to invite you into religion. It's relationships. Relationships thrive on remembering. Do they not think about when someone tells you that maybe you didn't even expect? I mean, you know, most of us have our circle going, you better say happy birthday to me, and you better say, and you better, and if you don't, I'm going to hold it against you. But then, but then you go outside of that circle, and when someone says happy birthday to you or happy anniversary, and it's not because Facebook reminded them, right? Doesn't that do something to you? You're like, wow. You remembered. The same thing happens with you and God. That if you'll choose to remember, if you'll make the effort to remember, it doesn't make God like you more. It makes the relationship thrive. So there's two rituals I want to talk about. Two, very simple. First one's communion. It's obvious. I mean, we've talked about it. Hopefully you've got the communion stuff. Um, if you're watching on TV, <clears throat> Go to your fridge, find a liquid and a solid. I don't know what to tell you. But, but I, here's what I want. Uh, think about communion, but can, can I, let's assume nothing. Let's spend a moment making sure, because I'm about to invite you to participate in communion, whether you're a member of this church or not. That's not at all what Scripture teaches about, but uh, I want to invite you into communion. But before we do that, Let's know what we're doing. This verse here about Jesus talking to his disciples, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread, blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, and you should have a little bit more color. The history hopefully helps you. Take this and eat it for this is my body. Hmm. My body. <clears throat> he would have, uh, by the way, it wouldn't have been this bread. This is, this is bread you and I like, uh, dense and awesome. Uh, theirs was different, but, but you'll notice that he, he, he broke it. He, you and I would, no, like, no, we got, that's gross. You, you've touched the bread now. That's disgusting, David. I don't want, no, we would cut it, right? And we would cut it likely before, um, anyone else saw it, or you would cut, cut your own, but they would break it because to use a knife on this was considered extremely harsh and brutal because this represented life to them. 
There was a representation at the table. They would always have bread at the table because it represented not just like, "Mm, I want some good carbs. It it represented life. And so that's why he broke it. He broke it on purpose because that was the appropriate way. He he broke it. Again, referring to his body. Saying, I'm about to do something related to my body. And it's going to give you access that you've not had. There's always been a holy of holies and a curtain. And he broke it, symbolizing what was about to play out. But he didn't stop there. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood. (laughs) Confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. If you're new to this, it sounds a bit morbid. He's brought up blood at dinner. What they would have known is, what you need to know, that the Bible spells this out, that every sin requires death. Sin is not free in the sense. You don't just get a sin because other people have sinned and everyone sins and so it's no big deal. It's always been a big deal and always will be a big deal. And so up to this point, you would come to church or the temple or whatever you call it, and you would, you would bring an animal or even buy an animal there and have it sacrificed. And Jesus is saying, I'm about to change everything. I'm not only going to give you access. I'm going to cover your sins. I'm going to forgive your sins so that you could spend forever, forever with him. And he gave us this tool called communion to keep you and I from forgetting what I just told you. So there's two things. I'm gonna oversimplify this. Two things, two things, and then we're gonna take communion together. So get it ready. Uh, If you got the things, or however you open it up, get it all ready, get the bread in one hand, get the juice in the other. If you you don't have it, go find it right now. And I want you to get ready. It's gonna sound like we're all clicking stuff and doing weird stuff. But I want you to get this open and ready. And then as you're doing this, I want you to understand clearly and succinctly what you're doing. You're not in an attempt trying to get God to like you. Step one, you are remembering why Jesus died. Here in a moment when I say, in a moment, when I say to eat the bread and drink the juice, you are remembering why he died. He died for you. He didn't die just for certain members of certain denominations. Die for you. And for you to remember this and for you to eat that bread and drink that juice, you are as an act saying, I'm not able to be good enough to forgive my own sins. I can't be religious enough, nice enough. I can't come from a good enough family. I can't have enough money. I need Jesus. So this requires humility and submission every time. You take communion. See, those are special moments, aren't they? Listen, God doesn't all of a sudden like you more right now. I'm not trying to be mean. But I bet if I interviewed everyone who just did that and said, so did you need that today? You'd probably say, yeah, I needed to remember what Jesus has done. It's not just a religion. It's a ritual designed. It's an anchor to help us. So my plan is to still have a voice for the rest of the sermon. So here we go. Let me walk you into the second one called baptism. Now, as I teach this, I just invited everyone to be a part of communion, correct? That's so-so. But anyways. Okay, okay. Process this. I wonder if Pastor David is going to invite all of us to be a part of baptism. All right, here we go. Uh, baptism reveals what we believe. And I mean that absolutely as literally as I can. I, it reveals it. I'm not like, ooh, like spiritually. Well, sure, but, but I'm talking like it actually like outs you. That's a part of its design is that you and I will, will have a conversation with God, often private. No one hears it. We speak to him. We talk to him. But, but on the outside, it's completely silent, and, and we don't even know that you're doing that. But then there's this moment. You can read about it in Scripture where, where it wasn't just like private. There was a public part. There was this, this, this courage 
that our faith needs. I think nowadays one of the problems with following the way of Jesus is we're trying to follow the way of Jesus while keeping everybody happy and and trying to be politically correct. And we're trying to follow Jesus without courage. And I love that Jesus built in that our faith requires and will continue to require courage. Courage. One after the other. Moment after the other. And it starts with this major act of courage. So, my guess is we've all been taught different stuff about baptism. This is where I get fun emails. Don't worry about it. So, listen. I know that you've been taught stuff. My, my approach, I, I have no intention of stepping on and, and ruining any of your past traditions But what I want to do is teach you what Scripture teaches, what the Bible teaches about baptism. Specifically, we're going to let Jesus teach us about baptism. And we'll begin to learn what we do. So to do so, I need to first take you to where one of the things goes off here. Uh, Luke 2, then it was time for their purification offering, as required by the law of Moses, after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Now, this is key. The law of the Lord says if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So we have evidence that Jesus' parents brought him to the temple, brought him to church to have him dedicated. And someone was like, yes, baptized. No. Dedicated. The reason we know this, I'll read you some more in the Bible about Jesus. Matthew 3 says, then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. He's no longer a kid. We actually believe he's around 30. But John tried to talk him out of it, which all of us probably be like, "Mm, no, 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 I don't know. Uh, I am the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said. So why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, it should be done for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. Jesus was dedicated. Then he was baptized. What's the lesson? Baptism is not someone else's decision. I I believe this is what Jesus was teaching by modeling what we do. There's a moment in life that you've got people in your life directing you. If you want to know your role as a parent, you better stink and direct your kids. This is not like, hey, you know, you just do your thing. No, 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 there's, Scripture teaches, direct your child, direct them. Oftentimes, you might need to grab the helmet, but like direct, direct. But good parenting is, you take, you take your hands off, and there becomes a moment as a parent when you begin to see the blessing of not just directing, but letting them make decisions on their own, because then their faith grows. So what do we do? If you're asking, you're like, so what do I do with this sermon, okay? And baptism and the ritual. Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Right now, some of you are followers of Jesus Christ, and you've never made your own decision to get baptized. It was someone else's decision. And right now, you're concerned because you're like, one, am I going to do it? But what's that going to mean to the people who had me baptized as a baby? I can tell you what it should mean. It means you actually are behaving out what they hoped would be true in your life. You're not dishonoring them. You're actually fulfilling what they prayed for. So uh, they get the response on what they should do. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins okay, and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So here in a moment, we're going to baptize people. Some signed up, some went to classes and stuff, and some of you don't know why your heart's beating more right now for some weird reason. If you want to know what we say to people before they get baptized, I'll show you a couple statements. One, I trust Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins. Why do we say that? Because we don't want to say I trusted myself for the forgiveness of my sins. Or I trust in some other fake God for the forgiveness of my sins. Or trust in my grandma's religion for the forgiveness of my sins. No. I trust Jesus. 1 John 1, 9 again. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us, cleanse us from all wickedness. 
The second statement that will have people actually like affirm and acknowledge, I'm committed to Jesus for the rest of my life. This is not like, hey, today and only today. This is, do you commit to follow him the rest of your entire life? This isn't, and do it perfectly. No, that's not in the statement. But do you commit to following Jesus for the rest of your life? Romans 6 spoke to a way of life. For, for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live, may live, may live new lives. You live new lives. You don't just get a new life. You live it out. If, this also explains a little bit, like, why do they put people underwater? Dead to your sins, to your old way of life. And then, yes, we do bring you out of the water. <laughs> to symbolize you will are a new person. You have been made new. You, by the grace and mercy of God and only God, you are spiritually resurrected. Now, some of you are in a quandary, so let me go back to where we started. I told you some history. I think you appreciated it about communion. Some of you are like, I didn't know all those details about communion and the curtain and the tearing and all that. And then you made a decision. What do I believe? Okay, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. And then you acted out communion. You did the ritual of communion. You tracking with me? I've had an agenda the whole time. Then I told you the history of Jesus' baptism. How it was not Mary and Joseph's decision for him. It was, it was his. And then you know there was a decision. In fact, John even pushes back. How about that one? <laughs> and then we know that Jesus, the actual action of getting baptized, and some of us right now are wrestling, and so that's why Romans 1.16, I think, spells this out real nice. For I am not ashamed, I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. You know why this has to be put in the Bible? Because some of us battle with being ashamed of it. Some of us battle with but do I have the courage? Will I, do, will I live out the courage? Is the, power, is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes? We're so glad you tuned in today. Fountain Springs Church is located in the Black Hills of South Dakota, but our community reaches beyond our neighborhoods and spreads around the whole world. Our website is a great way to give, get involved, and get connected. If you appreciate our ministry and want to be part of our mission to show people who Jesus is, here's what I'd recommend. Join us financially. When you do that, you're giving other people the opportunity to hear what you just heard. So here's a way to do that. Visit our website at fs.church give. And thank you so much for being with us today. And let's do our best this week to show people who Jesus is.